Number 51, the harbour process. The IB loves the harbour process. Let's look at the effect of temperature. If temperature is very high, chemistry is always going to be very fast, so your process will be very quick. But there's a problem with having a high temperature equilibrium. Since this is exothermic in the forward, I'm going to get a low yield. So maybe I'll only get 10% really fast. That's a problem. So let's look at a very low temperature. A very low temperature, well, chemistry goes really slowly at a low temperature. So whatever I do, it's going to take a long time. But the good thing is I'm going to get a high yield, say 90%. So I could wait a long time, but I'll get 90% ammonia. So what we need is the kind of Goldilocks condition, the Goldilocks temperature, which is 450 degrees C. And there's a little picture of Goldilocks. Not too hot, not too cold. 52, kinetic theory has three parts. For a successful reaction, we need a collision, energy greater than activation energy, and the correct geometry. 53, the effect of temperature on rate of reaction. There's always two points for this. One point for saying there's more collisions per unit time, which is the same as more frequent collisions. You can't just say collisions, though. And the other for higher energy collisions. That's the second point. 54, here's the Boltzmann distribution. He hung himself because no one really believed his theories. So learn his diagram then. Energy, number of particles on that axis. Mistakes are not hitting zero, zero, and not asymptote. And if you touch the axis, it's wrong. You have to asymptote, just like I've done there. It must asymptote. Or the IB have taken points off for that before. With these three diagrams, I can show activation energy on two of them. And I can show the effect of a catalyst on three of them. Now don't get these three diagrams confused. 56. KC is really, really big. That means there's lots of products. The reaction is favoring the products. And KC is really, really small, lots of reactants. bronsted lowry acid donates a proton to a bronsted lowry base. And a Lewis base donates a pair of electrons to a Lewis acid. 58. I remember conjugate acid is made by adding a proton. That's how I remember it. That's probably a better way, though. 59. Strong versus weak. Strong means it's fully dissociated, and weak means it's partially dissociated. Concentrated versus dilute, well, concentrated means there's lots of the solute in the solution, and dilute means there's not much solute in the solution. So then, is it possible to have a strong, weak acid? Nope, it's not. Is it possible to have a strong, dilute acid? Yes, it is. 60. The strong bases you need to know are group 1 hydroxides and barium hydroxide. Anything else must be a weak base. I've never heard of uranium hydroxide, but it must be a weak base. Iron oxide doesn't exist. You have to give me a number because it's a transition metal. Most transition metals need a number. If in doubt, put it in. An oxidizing agent is itself reduced. That's a little sign, so I sing to myself here. So that equation there, what's reduced is the sulfur. And so the sulfur 8 must be the oxidizing agent because it itself is reduced. 63. If you had this uh, table of electrochemical half cells, if you want to know the reaction that will happen, flip the most negative. Take the highest one on the list and flip it round and add it to the lowest one on the list. Flip the most negative. Then it's spontaneous. Spontaneous reactions have positive voltages. And if you flip the most positive, you're going to get a non-spontaneous reaction, and that will be a negative voltage. 65. Here is a really badly drawn voltaic cell. The metals are not touching the solutions, and the salt bridge isn't either, so that's really bad. 66. What carries the charge in a voltaic cell? Electrons in the wire and ions in the cell itself. Here's an electrolysis cell. That won't work. You need freely moving charged particles to conduct electricity, and solid salt is not freely moving. It does contain charged particles, though. Looking at the general formula, the first alkene is like aphromethene. Nope, it is not. The first alkene is ethene. 69. Don't get prope confused with bute. Three carbons is prope. Four is bute. 70, that's butane, and that's still butane. It's just got a bend in it. Same chemical.
Don't think they're different. They are identical. Aldehydes have a carbon double bond O, the carbonyl group at the end. Ketones have it in the middle. One ends with aldehyde, methaldehyde. The other ends with own, acid, uh, ethanone, for example. Naming esters, put a cut in your, in your molecule, keeping the oxygens on one side and cutting the carbon-oxygen bond. Oxygens on one side, cut the carbon-oxygen bond. And then just name it. 73, if you halogate halogenate an alkane. I missed out ultraviolet here. I should have put UV. But why are these radicals so reactive? Well, one, they have a lone electron, and two, they've just been hit with high energy ultraviolet. Of course they're going to be reactive. They have a high energy. 74, if I brominate ethane, sorry, brominate ethene, am I going to get 1,1-dibromoethane? No, I'm not. Bromine's really big. It won't fit Two of them won't fit comfortably on the first carbon. So it's 1,2-dibromoethane is produced. And 75. Find the OH, find the carbon attached to it. How many carbons directly attached to that? Primary, secondary, tertiary. 